Welcome to the presentation for Outdoor Emergency Care, Chapter 10, Shock. When we talk about shock as emergency care providers, we're not just talking about the emotional shock of being injured or somebody who sees blood or a disaster and has an emotional psychological response. We are talking about a physiological condition of hypoperfusion. So lack of perfusion of blood, oxygenated hemoglobin, and glucose. So this means anything that interferes with the delivery of oxygen and nutrients to your cells. So we'll start with a case presentation. Pause and read this case over. So as you're out on duty as a ski patroller, you notice this gentleman and stop to check on him. And you end up doing a patient assessment on your secondary assessment on the head to toe, you find some abdominal and chest tenderness on this guy. So you should already be familiar with the anatomy and physiology of the circulatory system from our discussions about cardiovascular emergencies. So quickly to review when we talk about the circulatory system, we're talking about the pump, the pipes, and the fluid. So the heart, the blood vessels, and the blood itself. Problem with any of the three parts of the system or the parts of the body that they flow through can be a cause of shock. Here again is the representation of the circulatory system. You're still responsible for knowing the pattern of flow of a blood cell as it enters the right atrium, right ventricle, pulmonary artery, pulmonary vein, left atrium, left ventricle, aorta, arteries, arterioles, capillaries, venules, veins, vena cava, and back into the right atrium. Important to note that when we talk about a patient being in shock, they're not just in shock or not in shock. They will progress from compensated shock, where the body is able to keep up with whatever the problem is and maintain function, to decompensated shock, where it's no longer able to maintain function, and finally irreversible shock, after which the organs start to die or are completely damaged. So the patient is going to die or have serious complications. There are four broad categories of shock that we're concerned with. First is hypovolemic shock, which is a problem with the fluid. The most common cause being not enough blood to deliver oxygen and nutrients to the tissues and to remove the waste products. So if you've lost a lot of blood, you would be in hypovolemic shock, the most common type of shock that we deal with as ski patrollers. Cardiogenic shock, a problem with the pump or the heart. So if the patient has had a heart attack and their heart muscle is not pumping well anymore, they'll have cardiogenic shock. Distributive shock is a problem with the blood vessels throughout the body. If they're dilated or have some other condition that's preventing them from functioning well, you'll have distributive shock. Septic shock, which is a type of distributive shock. The patient has a serious infection and the body responds by releasing chemicals that cause the blood vessels to dilate. Anaphylactic shock, a life-threatening response to an allergen, causes widespread vasodilation, meaning there's too much space in the pipes for the blood and it can't reach the tissues in adequate amounts. Neurogenic shock is when damage to the spinal cord prevents normal neurologic input to the blood vessels, so they relax and dilate. Finally, the fourth type, obstructive shock, is when there's a clog in the system somewhere, or something is putting pressure on the heart, therefore preventing the blood from flowing adequately. So the causes of obstructive shock would include tension pneumothorax, where the air pressure in your chest cavity is pushing on the heart and great vessels, so blood can't flow back into the heart adequately and then can't be pumped out to the body. And pericardial tamponade, it's the heart itself that's being squished and it's unable to pump. And finally, pulmonary embolism. If you've got a clog in your pulmonary artery and all your blood needs to flow through there, then it can't. Following up on our case study, we've obtained a sample history from this gentleman 
We're learning the patient takes a blood thinner and also a beta blocker. And both those two classes of medications you should be generally familiar with and be thinking about how those will significantly impact a patient in this condition. With any of the four types of shock, there are various factors that are going to determine how the patient's body is able to compensate and respond. Pediatric patients, children, are going to be able to maintain homeostasis for a much longer period of time as compared to an adult despite increasing blood loss but then once they are out of blood they decompensate very quickly. Seniors, elderly patients, are less able to compensate for blood loss at the beginning of the injury and so they will decompensate sooner. Patients with existing illnesses or other injuries may have difficulty compensating for shock. Prescription medications can alter the body's normal response to injury or illness. So of particular concern to us are the blood thinners, which will make a patient more susceptible to hypovolemic shock. as They have a reduced ability to clot and stop any internal bleeding or external bleeding that's happening. And this will also be important when we talk about closed head injuries. Beta blockers affect your beta system, which is part of your sympathetic nervous system and fight or flight response. You can generally recognize the beta blocker drugs because their names end in LOL. So metoprolol, atenolol, carvedilol, all of these will reduce the body's ability to respond with an epinephrine response. So you're less likely to see the tachycardia, the pale, cool, clammy skin that is helping the body to compensate for blood loss. During your patient assessment on every patient that you deal with, particularly trauma patients in the ski patrol environment, you want to be concerned with and suspicious of the development of shock. First indication may come from the scene size up. A large volume of blood on the snow should have you thinking about the possibility of hypovolemic shock. A patient who's experiencing an allergic reaction should be monitored for signs of anaphylaxis. So listed on this slide are some of the signs and symptoms of shock. For a patient in shock, it's important to monitor their vital signs closely and look for trends. Again, this is not something that happens all at once. This is a progression. And here is that progression. This is from page 335 in your textbook. The patient presentation changing as it progresses through the stages of shock. So in compensated shock, the patient presents with tachypnea, tachycardia, cool skin, delayed capillary refill, altered mental status, usually anxiety, normal blood pressure. So the cool skin is a sign that the body is shunting blood away from the periphery, keeping it in the core, keeping the blood pressure up to keep the brain and vital organs oxygenated. When the body can no longer keep the tissues adequately perfused, the patient starts to decompensate. And the telltale sign here is a decreasing blood pressure. Critical threshold is systolic of less than 90 millimeters of mercury. The heart rate will continue to rise, Depending on brain function, the breathing may become shallow and slow at this point, and capillary refill will be significantly delayed. The patient's level of responsiveness at this point will start to decrease, again, due to brain function. Once you hit the point where the cells start to die, and you have organ failure, brain death, and the patient is likely to die from this irreversible shock. As far as treatments that we have for shock, probably the most important thing we can do is to maintain core body temperature. Keeping the patient warm in the ski patrol environment is very difficult to achieve, but it's one of the most crucial things that we can do for a patient. High flow oxygen or maintaining oxygen saturation greater than 94% will also benefit these patients. Something that you see in the textbook, but that is no longer current medical practice, is to elevate the feet above the head 
or to transport in the head downhill position in the toboggan. And this was an attempt to shunt blood from the legs to the core. This is pretty widespread throughout ski patrol and EMS practice still. But the difficulty that this poses is that by elevating the feet, the internal organs press up against the diaphragm, which causes respiratory restriction, increased intrathoracic pressure, which may actually make shock worse. So putting the patient in this Trendelenburg position with their feet uphill in the toboggan is slowly going away, but you may still see it on the test. So the patroller on the call in our case study has wisely recognized this patient is at risk for hypovolemic shock because he's on blood thinners and we believe he's got internal injuries. So he has bought himself a helicopter ride. So a surgeon can get in there, stop the bleeding, preserve those red blood cells, hopefully save this patient's life. In summary, shock is a dangerous and life-threatening medical condition that's made worse by the cold temperatures that we deal with. Recognizing early signs of shock can be difficult, so it's important to monitor changes in vital signs over time, looking for that increasing heart rate, looking for anxiety, and looking for falling blood pressure. Treatment priorities. Stop whatever is causing the shock if possible. Stop the bleeding. Splint the injuries. Keep the patient warm. Keep the patient warm. Administer high flow oxygen and transport to a higher level of care. For the test, also elevate the feet or transport feet uphill in the toboggan. That concludes our lesson on shock.